wait a minute. There we go. Welcome to another edition of Interruptions. My next guest today played 17 seasons in the NFL, most notably for the Philadelphia Eagles. He is also a legendary broadcaster as well. For, and he's also a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant businessman. I'm talking no other than the legendary number seven. And it's funny because I was born September the 7th. I'm talking about Ron Jaworski, yeah. a.k.a. Jaws. How you doing, sir? Uh, Otis, great to be with you, man. It's it, it, it's so much fun. We can align ourselves with number seven. You know, that's good. That's hey, hey, hey there we go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey. It, uh, uh, that, that, I, since we, you mentioned number seven, now, I was drafted by the L.A. Rams in 1973. So I got to L.A., you know, I'm out of Youngstown State, and I go in the equipment room, and the equipment manager says, uh, okay, what number do you want? So I said, uh, I, I, I'm on number seven. He starts laughing. You okay. know, Don Hewitt was the equipment manager. He starts laughing. I said, what are, you la what are you laughing about, Don? He goes, number seven? That number's retired. That's Bob Waterfield's number. I said, oh, man. I, I should have did my research before I asked for Bob Waterfield's number. You know, so, But I, I was still able to get number seven a little bit later in Philadelphia. Right. That's right, because you were drafted by the Rams. Correct. Yeah, and seeing that that's why I didn't even mention that. That's why I said most notably, because we yeah. know you more so for the Rams. I mean uh, hey, for the Eagles. Wherever I Eagles. get a paycheck as well, you know, a couple of years behind Marino and Miami, Marino in Kansas yeah. City, you know. Hey, we try to get that paycheck. Ain't nothing like it. <laughs> <laughs> My first question uh for you today is um do you uh think that the uh, I man, what do you think about the college and the NFL game today? How it's being played? It, it, it's kind of interesting. I'm I'm starting to see more of the collegiate style uh, morphing into the National Football League, uh, right. and 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 I think you know the the rules have really opened it up. Uh, and I applaud Rod Goodell a few years ago when he started changing the way the game is played for me physical nature, you know, right. leading with the head and the tackling and all the things. And they, I mean, I, I think he made the game safer and we would probably both agree with that, but it opened yes. the game up and, and, it, and the teams that were playing the, the open style of offense, you know, at the collegiate levels, you know, were, were the ones that also these guys start coming to the NFL and bringing, you know, the, the, the uh, Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray type style, you know, the, right. not only the really good passers, but outstanding runners, they stretch the field, not only uh, horizontally from end zone to end zone, but vertically from sideline to sideline. So mm -hmm. I, I think when when everyone started seeing, ooh, we can go to three wide receivers, four wide receivers. I'm even right. looking at tape now and looking at five wide receivers on the field. You know, these yeah. inside zone reads, outside zone reads. You're seeing a lot of different styles of the quarterback position that in the past was reserved for the collegiate game. Now it's infiltrating the NFL. And, you know, the Patrick Mahomes may have started himself just a few years ago with all the movement that he does outside the pocket and throwing on the run. Yeah, and I, I was uh, curious about that because it, it segues way into my next question. That's why I wanted to ask you what was your thoughts uh, on on the league, you know, as far as collegiate and uh, the NFL. Do you, when I look at that, do you feel like high, from high school to college, right, that sometimes they do a disservice to the quarterback position because they're calling the plays from the line of scrimmage. So now when the when the, when the young player gets into the NFL. And the coaches are asking him to get in the huddle and call the plays. And you know from playing that position, the playbook is thick. And then the verbiage, because you're setting the protection, you know, the routes, you're setting everything by the call play. These guys now take a step back because they, before they can learn to play, they're trying to say to play. No, no, no question. I think the fact that uh, many of the collegiate quarterbacks don't call their own plays hinders their ability to get to the next level or it hinders them when they get to the next level. Right. Uh, because, you know, the, the, the game at the NFL, yeah, you certainly have to have talent, but it, it is so cerebral. And not only at the quarterback position, every position. You know, if you're in that defensive secondary, you know the communication and calling plays and recognition, right. you know, is so important. Formations they come out with, tendencies, how do you adapt on the fly? And, and so when I, when I watch quarterbacks now that, you know, look to the sideline and the coach holds up, you know, a sign or something like that, I'm going, right. what the hell is going on? I, you know, okay. yeah, I'm like, the, the quarterback's got to, you know, got to be in, put that team in position. And maybe it's worked. Maybe teams do it because it does work. You know, I have never been in a situation where I've had to do that. Um, right. 
but I, I've always felt at the NFL level, I don't think you'll ever see that uh, from a from a complete audibleization perspective because so much is done at the line of scrimmage in the NFL by the quarterback or even the quarterback of the defense. If it's your linebacker or safety, you recognize things. You got to get out of bad plays and into good plays. And that's and that's why I asked you that question because I'm seeing um, a situation where the 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 quarterbacks. Um, and, and, and it's amazing because it seems like, say you take an athletic quarterback, right? Mm-hmm. And instead of going to a traditional offensive style, I'm talking about leaving high school and going to college, they will pick the, you know, the spread formation. They will pick the way well, I, I can move around. And, and of course you want a, a quarterback that's athletic, just keep the athleticism. But I think a lot of players today I wanted to get your thoughts. On, sometimes maybe we are choosing the wrong colleges to go to, as far as the system wise that can help them when they reach the next level. Oh, I, yeah, I, I would agree with you on that, Otis, as well. In fact, yeah, I, I may be kind of an example of that. Now, when I came out of high school, this is going way back in the day. Now, I <laughs> graduated right. in 1969 from Lackawanna High School outside of Buffalo, and I was okay. recruited by 38 colleges. Okay. Uh, offered me scholarships, and it went from Pitt to Penn State to Georgia Tech to Florida State to Wyoming. I end up at Youngstown State, and it's it's right. it's a question now uh, that most people don't ask. But back in the day, they did. You know, why did you go to Youngstown State? Well, quite simply, I was six foot two, about one hundred and sixty pounds. I wasn't mature enough to go to what I thought was a major college school of Pitt, okay. Penn State, uh, Syracuse, and Ben Schwartzwalder, and where. You know, they were still running a lot of that veer and wishbone stuff, you know. Right. And, and, right. And, and my talent was coming out of high school, I was a passer. I was a thrower. And so I'm recruited down to Youngstown State, and Dyke Beatty's the head coach. And he says, you know, Ron, you come here. We're going to throw it 35 times a game. I said, where do I sign? You know, okay. That's what I wanted to do. And, and I think, you know, if it was it was the right situation for me. And, I, you know, it wouldn't have been right for everybody, but it was for me to go to a school that was going to allow me to throw the football. So I fit. Well, my talent was to throw the football, and at a young age, I hadn't matured yet. My body hadn't matured to, you know, what I played in the NFL at about two fifteen and six two and a half. So, uh, my physical size impacted that as well. Well, that's good because when you got to the league, and you you needed that two fifteen because oh yeah, LT, <laughs> the LT coming. You need oh, you need it. Good day, wait. Otis. Why'd you bring that up? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll get. We're not going to talk about LT. It's about you. Uh, <laughs> do you do you feel and, and this is um um like i said i, I named the show interruptions because i like to interrupt normal thought process so <laughs> when i ask you this question you may interrupt my thought process but the question is do you believe this generation of athlete hasn't learned how to overcome adversity not every athlete but just as a as a as a, as a group uh, because and the reason I asked that question just to give you some context is because it seems like when you and I was coming up, of course you're older than me. I'm 49, yep. but coming up, I could come home and say, "Dad, I should be starting the coach. You know, he's, he's not starting me." And he wouldn't say, "All right, we'll go to another team." He would tell me, "Well, you need to go to practice the next day. You need to show him that you are worthy of being the, you know, the starter at your position." Well, it seems like now it's a generation from from Pee Wee football on up that if that kid doesn't start, then we're just going to go play somewhere else. And then when you get to the NFL and you get some adversity, they don't know what to do. Yeah, ex- exactly. I, I think every player that, that's made it, say, to the NFL level or success in football, baseball, basketball, a- education, whatever it may be, uh-huh. you know, you, you, you certainly it wasn't handed to you and, and, and you have to earn it. And, and it's interesting, I was, uh, as I, I was driving this morning, I, I'm listening to John Calipari, uh, the head okay. coach of Kentucky. Right. And the, the, seven, the 76ers drafted in the 21st pick one of his players. And he was talking about just kind of what you, what you were just saying about, you know, young athletes, they want everything given to them. They've never had to battle for it. You know, they come to college, or their, their parents want them to be the starter immediately when they walk on a court. And, right. and, and, and John used the term fight or flight. 
which which mm-hmm. really resonated with me. Hey, you know what? Mm-hmm. You're, hey, you're coming to Kentucky. You better come here to fight for your position or flight. That's you're going to be out of here. So it right. resonated with me just when when you asked that question, what what he meant by that, you know? Because when you get to the, the from high school to college, you're you know, hey, it's it's a quantum leap. And then when you get right. from college to professional football, baseball, basketball, it's another quantum leap. And you better be ready to fight or you're not going to win a job. Fight or flight. I like that. I got to start using that. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll give John this credit. i give John this credit for it, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that. <laughs> do, you, do you feel in the NFL when you are watching these uh, young quarterbacks uh, trying to develop uh, versus, you know, when you came along, uh, and even after you, do you feel like the NFL teams are starting to quit on these young uh, young quarterbacks too fast, given what you and I just talked about as far as the systems that they're coming out of in college? I, I, Otis, I, I think the expectations are always too high. Uh, okay. you know, and, and I don't think people really – understand not only from a coaching perspective but a fan's perspective you know you draft a guy number one in the first round they expect him to come in the league and take it on by storm that just doesn't happen occasionally it does happen but I I look at like Patrick Mahomes sat behind Alex Smith for a year in Kansas Mm -hmm. City you know he didn't splash onto the scene he learned how to play the position at the NFL level and and I don't only mean that and, and you know you know what it's like to be in that locker room and be around men, grown men. There's a certain different mentality you have to have when you get to play big boy football. You gotcha. may have all the talent in the world, but it's a it's a it's a quantum leap. How do you deal with the locker room? How do you deal with travel? How do you deal with moving? All those things come into play. And I just think when a guy is drafted and he's anointed the, the savior of the organization, it's just mm-hmm. added pressure on him. I'm, I'm kind of a little bit old school in this theory, maybe because it's how it worked for me. Sure. I was a backup behind John Hadle and James Harris in my formative years of my career. And I think I, I was helped by those guys to become a better person as well as a better player they took the time to teach me and groom me and and, and make me a, a better person and player as well so yeah. to me that's kind of the way i i like it so um when i look at guys being thrust out there immediately i think they- uh, it, now, do you do you believe though sometimes it takes some guys a little bit longer to develop but Given how NFL teams are structured, you know, far as with the general managers, uh, the owners, people are just not patient enough now to let that guy develop. You know, it, it, it's like it's like if you don't hit the ground running the rookie year, that second and third year, you you better be showing us that you're the guy. If not, they're looking for someone else. Well, you know, owners come into play too. You know, and and, and right. you know, you know, I, I've been around the league as a player for 17 years, and as you mentioned when you brought me in, I've been a pro football analyst with ESPN, the NFL Network, since I retired in 1990. So I, I try to stay close to the game, not only on the field but off the field. And there is no doubt, no doubt in my mind whatsoever that when you take a quarterback in the, in, in the first round. That owner is going, hey, man, I just paid this guy a lot of money. We drafted him in the first round. Get him on the field. All of a sudden, he's, he's not playing. He's, he's knocking on the coach's door. Hey, okay. I, I just gave this guy millions of dollars. Why isn't he playing? Why? So the coach okay. then succumbs to that pressure. Damn, I don't want to lose my job. This owner is on my butt right now knocking on my door. Why am I not playing that young quarterback? Right. So, right. Uh, so I think the, the external pressure becomes very, very di- difficult for coaches not to play those high draft choices. So, and that's the way to my next question. So, do you feel that they, I mean, not feel, but do you believe that these young quarterbacks, like take now coming out, so you got Trevor Lawrence, uh, you have um, um, Fields, Justin yep. Fields, Ohio State. So, do you believe that they should start thinking, and it behooves them to, you got to eat, sleep that playbook, even on the off season, yeah. you can't look at it as okay. I came in it was my rookie year. I got my feet wet. You got to be ready to, like you said, be leaders of men because actually, even even if you're the number one or the number two pick overall, that leash is not as long as they think they think it is. That, that, that is correct. And maybe, you know, maybe a guy like say Dwayne Haskins in Washington, out of Ohio State. You know, right. he, I mean, hey, he he came out of Ohio State. He was a one year wonder. I right. mean, he, he played phenomenal. You can't take that away. Right. That being said, you know, l- look at the fact that 
he only played one season at Ohio State. He didn't have right. the advantage of learning and, and growing. And all of a sudden, he's thrust into the NFL, uh, a high draft choice, and the pressure on him to perform is extraordinary. It, it's extraordinary for him to perform. You can you can't almost get to that bar that is set for you. People want him to play immediately, get him on the field. He's our future, blah, blah, blah. And and he hasn't fa- he's failed up to this point, but he hasn't failed overall. I think he needs to be in a, a better situation where he doesn't have to feel all that extraneous pressure on him to perform every single day. And he was probably overdrafted because of the great year he had. You can't take that year away. But you know, right. and you mentioned mentioned Trevor Lawrence. I like the fact that maybe I subscribe to the Bill Parcell school a little bit. You know, okay. Bill Bill liked. You know, he wanted a, a four-year starter, three or four-year starter in college. Right. He wanted a team captain. And I've had many conversations with this about Bill. He actually – he evaluated that quarterback position in college. He would talk about guys that got their butt kicked a few times. They had a game okay. where they threw three or four interceptions, and the coach is on them, the fans are on them. And, and okay. when he did his research, he wanted to find out how that quarterback handled it. Because in the NFL, you're going to get knocked down. You're going to be humiliated. You're going to be Correct. embarrassed. How do you deal with that? So – I kind of subscribe to that that theory a little bit. I want a guy to be a three or four year starter. I want him to be a team captain, and I want him to have lost a couple of games where he played poorly. Now that yeah, may sound like the negative, but that's how you, you know it. You've been around guys. You know, yeah. uh, some guys wilt when they're under pressure. Some guys thrive right. on it. Yeah, yeah. That that's a good. That you know what you your answer <laughs> allowed me to ask this question. I didn't even have this as a question, but I I have to ask you. Do you, in, in your profession, right, far as uh, being an analyst, as you've been for so many years and done a great job, do you sometimes, uh, when you're when you're sitting there, uh, whether it's been NFL Network or whether it's Fox, and you hear some commentators, and you're listening, and you're like, this guy doesn't have a clue of what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I say that is because football is the ultimate team sport, right? Yeah. So... Just like just like on the defensive side, the front end and the back end works together. Like yep. you can have a great pass rusher, but if 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 the DBs can't cover for three seconds, what what difference does it make what what the pass rusher can do? The receiver is going to be open. Uh, you can have a great uh, uh, um, um, the skill set uh, at the receiver, the running back, whatever. But if the front five those guys up for, for, doesn't block, nothing's going to happen. Do yep. you sometimes get uh, get a little perturbed when you see certain analysts commenting on teams and whatever, and you're sitting back and you're looking at the footage and they're making comments and you're saying they don't have a clue what is going on? Yeah, there are a lot. And, and, and you know, when, when I was calling Monday Night Football, you know, there are certain times you, you wish you could take things back. You know, uh, unfortunately, you're on the air for three, three and a half hours. You got to comment on everything, you know, right. and on everything. Right. And I was fortunate to work with, you know, Mike Tirico and John Gruden and Tony yeah. Kornheiser. And our preparation was impeccable because we knew that's what it was going to take to be successful. But, the, the, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to throw uh, my colleagues on the networks under the bus. But, you know, because there are times, you know, you get a th- not quite sure, but you say something, go, I wish I wouldn't have said that, you know, and and then, and then, and and then there are times like the next day I'd go look at the tape, the all 22 and say, no, I, you know, I said that, but that was wrong. Yeah. That was, that wasn't a corner (laughs) cat or, you know, whatever, whatever it was, I, I, I miscall it during the game, but, you know, but for the most part, you know, I, I have great respect for the guys that call games now because, you know, you, you, you got to study, you got to be prepared. You go to teams practices, you talk to coaches, you talk to players. So uh, I, I think for the most part, uh, all the play-by-play guys and analysts have done a really good job. Okay. I've got two more questions for you. That sure. was just a bonus question. That was a bonus, bonus question. Qu- bonus was- question. <laughs> <laughs> so how did how did you get into uh, managing uh, country clubs? Uh, that's a question everybody asks me. You know, I, I presently own and operate seven golf clubs in the Philadelphia area. But right. way back in the, in the mid-'70s, okay. I remember at, a, at an NFL Player Association meeting, Steve Garvey, who was then the, the director of the NFL Player Association, you know, made this speech and he talked about the average career of the NFL player was that at that time about three and a half years. Right. And I'm sitting there in that meeting and I'm like, yeah, I'm like, my, this thing's my re- rookie or second year. I'm going, damn, that's it. I mean, that, that's it because everyone thinks you play forever. You know how, how right. we are. We're going to play forever. And the average career was three and a half years at that time. It's down to 3.1 right now, by the way. So it's going downward. And, and so I, I started thinking about, man, I better prepare myself for that injury that's likely to happen or whatever it may be. So I have something to fall back on. So I started 
looking at opportunities. And uh, finally, in 1979, with, with one of my teammates, John Bunting, who was a linebacker with the Eagles, uh, okay. we, we leased the golf course. And uh, okay. it, did, it did pretty pretty well. You know, we made some bear money. So I said, hey, this okay. may be something I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start thinking about as I, as I move on in the twilight of my career. And I grew the golf business. And um, I'm knocking on wood as I'm saying that because even this pandemic, the golf has been good, um, sure. actually very good. So uh, it, it's something I've been doing for, for well, since 1979. So uh, I've been very fortunate, and I love it. I love people. I love being around people. And uh, I love the game of golf, although my, my game isn't that good. I love to play. <laughs> hey, well, listen, as long as you're on your golf course at your country club when you're playing, it doesn't matter if you win, You, you the, the checks are ringing. So you still oh, winning. No, 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 no. You, we compete, man. Come on. You know how it is. When you got, yeah, yeah, we, we, we're just, I know you our compete. Blood. We, we got to win, but, man. If but, if but, but you win it. You win in either way. It's all right. <laughs> okay, now that's good. There you go. That's right, what I'm saying. Yeah. When we let compete, me, man, it, your, it was a dollar bet. You get you get that dollar back. You know. <laughs> let me get your comment, Eric. Uh, I had the pleasure to interview um, Eric Davis, uh, former uh, San Francisco Forty Nine er cornerback, and he said that uh, being a dumb jock is a oxymoron. The two don't go together because you have to be a smart player in order to play in the NFL. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? There's absolutely no doubt about it. You you have to be smart to play in the NFL. I don't and I don't like the term dumb jock either because I think right. most people that would use that term really have no clue of what it takes to get to the level that we played at. You know. To get to, to to the NFL and to compete every single day, the effort, the energy, uh, and not only from the physical standpoint, the, from mm-hmm. the mental standpoint of the game, the tape study that goes in, and the awareness and alertness you have to have as a player, instant recognition of, of what an offense or a defense is doing as you're out there for your job. So clearly, uh, you know the preparation is important as the playing, and sure. and, and and there's there, there's 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 no one dumb uh, that I've been around playing professional sports. So uh, there's a tremendous commitment for greatness yeah i just wanted to put that out there because a lot of times people think well you know he's not that bright or this that and, the other. and they don't understand in order to play that that game in uh football you you have to be intelligent because you mentioned it early you got to be cerebral at all yeah. positions and, and so you know what's final and, and, and you know you know when when you know the, around draft time you know this always comes out the Wonderlick test, the you know, Wonderlick, yeah. the Wonderlick test. You know, are you kidding me? That's going to, you know, hey, does it is is it a piece of the puzzle? Yes, but that's not going to determine your success or failure. That's all. What is what was the score in the Wonderlick test? Yeah, I, I I'll take that in consideration, but I'm going to watch that game, uh, you know, Texas Baylor as well, and say, okay, that guy could play or not play. You know, but it's all a piece of the pie. But I I hate when everyone wants to know those Wonderlick scores and someone didn't score well on them, they become a dummy. You know, that's that's BS. Well, I'm going to put this out in the atmosphere. It's not a question, but I'm just going to put it out in the atmosphere. I think more, especially young quarterbacks, when they're getting ready to come out, like say this year, whether it's Trevor Lawrence, whether it's Justin Fields, whomever, I think they need to get with you and learn how to break down game film, oh, yeah. how to study the game film, how to, when you're going over looking at their throws, to say, okay, that was a good throw, but here's the problem with that throw. With that throw in college, you waited for him to come open. When you get to the league, you can't wait for him to come open. You're going to have to throw him open. And it will make, because I think you have a lot to offer for them, helping them learn the cerebral part of the game and watching the game. So I just want to put that out there in the atmosphere that they, if they don't do anything else, they need to come see Jaws and look at some game tape. <laughs> hey, I, I love the tape. You know, I mean, it, I, I've always, you know, I felt that can give me an advantage. And uh, I recently did a podcast with Peyton Manning and, and we talked about the same thing, that right. preparation. So when you break that huddle and you see the defensive line with the depth of a safety, the depth of the corner, where's the linebacker? I mean, get, you know, we get to the point where is his right foot up or back? Cause there's, you can find hints, tips and indicator from tape study and looking it over and over again and replay every situation before you get in the game, before your kickoff at one o'clock right. on a yeah. Sunday or an eight 20 on a Monday night, you have played that game cerebrally in your mind already. So clearly I think the tape study is an absolute critical part of preparation for games. 
My and my final question for you is what has continued to have you working when you could possibly quote unquote if you want to say retire far as you, you know just doing what you want to do far as not worrying about working what keeps jaws going what keeps your drive going oh my wife wouldn't let me sit around the house she'd throw me out <laughs> yeah that'll do it that'll do it <laughs> that's, that's that'll do it foremost. but also you know I, I i like being around people uh i i like to work i like to experiment and do different things and you know one thing we didn't we, we didn't get a chance to mention but i'll mention is, is my foundation um the jaws yeah. use playbook we we've uh raised uh, six million dollars for at-risk youth in our community uh, wow. We've built ball fields, playgrounds, parks, nutritious food. So um, I like that part of being out in the public. And, and I've been fortunate. I've been blessed. Uh, and, and, and I really enjoy working with my foundation, the great work that we do to, to help those that are, are less fortunate. So uh, I can't stop doing that. I got I to gotta keep that right. ball moving, you know, driving down the field. Well, I'm gonna make sure I post the uh, when it when it comes out that I have the uh, the, uh, the the uh, website to the foundation Great, thank out you. there, and so people can look more and more and more. Didn't you uh, didn't you put out a book a while back? The, uh, yeah, seven games that that changed the NFL, games that changed the game. So um, I I did it with uh, Greg Cosell and Dave Plout at NFL Films, and we researched for about two years, and it, it, it we we had so much fun with it. We actually found some tape at a museum up in Boston, film from the 1963 Chargers Patriots game, and we wow. use that as one of the games for a Sid Gilman spreading the field, attacking down the field. Right. Uh, one of the games that changed the game. So uh, it was, it I mean, it, it was, it was absolutely. We had fun doing it. The book was a, a big seller, and. That, that was a few years ago, so I'm looking to actually add a few chapters to the book with some of the things that I've seen in the game re more recently. Well, if I may ask, can I get a copy of that Go book? Go get you one. <laughs> I I'll appreciate get, it. I appreciate I'll, it. I'll, I'll please, give my mic. Please autograph it. One. <laughs> please autograph it. Please, right, yeah. please. You got it. And <laughs> please, please stay safe and continue to be who you are. You are a treasure. You are a blessing uh, to the game of football, also to, in just life in general. Uh, you inspire me to do what I'm doing, and it's nothing that you're doing uh, extraordinary. It's just you being yourself, and I appreciate that because, you know, we never know who's watching and who's looking. Yep. So thank you for your Thanks again. Uh, thank you uh, for coming on the show, and like I say, stay safe and stay blessed. And we'll do it again. Thanks, Otis. All right. Peace. All right. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. Those are fun.